want to talk about the artistic and stylistic inspirations for the hit Netflix series The Witcher. Hi everybody, welcome to another Got Academy video. Hello, Asi, welcome back. You are our cinema buff, cinema expert. You're also a big uh, art uh, enthusiast. And tell me what you think. I felt that there were a lot of uh, gothic elements there. Very dark, very bleak. A lot of churches and crosses, like Christian symbolism, which we don't usually see. Of course, there are also pagan and uh, other stuff there. Because it feels like post-medieval a little bit. Even the courts, they're cleaner and stuff. But it felt to me like very 17th, 18th century Europe. Mm. What do you think? What is makes this goth? You feel like a small, in, like when you go into a church and you're small in front of God, like God is big and human yes. is very, very small. And uh, Yes, the ceiling is, is like 30 meters high. This is like gothic architecture, of, like you said, of the A of the yeah. 18th centuries and uh, like Notre Dame and everything like that. Yeah. So here the, the characters, they are very small in face of the power of fate. People linked by destiny will always find each other. Which could yeah. you say that it could be God? You can decide whatever you want to decide. I told you last time I was in Sintra that I wasn't coming back. Yet here you are. Here. You've come for your child of surprise. This is content, right? This is what you see. This is churches and kings and like... But now in terms of stylistic, when you say goss today, it comes with, an, with a lot of baggage. Okay. With the gothic subculture okay. that we know, right? And love. We know and love. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not the original gothic culture. It has... It's, the gothic subculture is very interesting, I think. It has a lot of influences. And uh, some of them are also like the content that you talked about, like they have like the gothic uh, literature. So they, okay. uh, they really like Edgar Allan Poe and all these like romantic uh, literature that is in the 18th century with courts and churches and kings. And usually it's and fantastic also. Yeah, and it's usually very tragic and very, it has a lot of angst in it. Oh, like it has a gothic subculture. Of course, it's not usually Catholic, you know, even they have even though they have this costly kind of imagery. Because know, Polish, uh, Poland is very, very Catholic. Yes, even though, but you know, they're not, it's not like in the Gothic 18th century when you're small against the God. Here they usually take it like against something else, usually against like technology or government or society. You can take this kind of element of being like victimized or being, or this angst again, angst against yeah. something. Yeah. It doesn't have to be against God. <laughs> If you think of cinematic influences for the goth, um, for the gothic like subculture, okay, um, it will you have to come to the German expressionism of the. I have to. You have to. I have to. And I think it's very. Uh, yeah, you, there's no. You can't do anything else. I'm coming. <laughs> First of all, the gothic subculture. It actually comes from music, of course, from the 1980s. It's like a punk. Yeah, post-punk. 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 Not punk. Post-punk. Right. Right. So post-punk, it's a post-punk subgenre. There were several of them actually in the 1980s. And the goss subculture kind of is the one that I think lasted the longest. And that we still know what it is to be goss. We still have these ideas of what we got. And I think the reason is probably because they have some such a, a diversity of a kind of influences from artistical literature, film, and then... Okay. Okay, and so, so, you, so you do see in The Witcher uh, the gothic uh, yes. elements outside of the churches and the fact that they're walking around in a lot of yes, dark places? Yes, of course, of course. I see it, okay. and I see it through the, expre the German Expressionism. <laughs> when you see the gothic subcultures and their influences in terms of uh, their filmic influences uh, include a lot of horror. Films. Horror, okay. Yeah. And there are ho ho horror elements in a the show. Yeah, very much so. Fuck. And I thought you didn't like horror films, but... Uh, it's the context that matters. It's the context, okay. It, because there's, it, it wasn't just about the battle. He didn't want to kill the monster, so there was, that said, it was more than just the, the You horror. have the problem with like, when the horror film is just about like this... Yes. Making you scared, yes. kind of, and... Exactly. So I don't know if you like ex German Expressionism, maybe. <laughs> okay. 
well, expressionism started before the First World War. Before the First World yeah. War, okay. It was, so uh, it's it, after Romanticism. Yeah, it's painting, first of all, and also in architecture. It's a very wide kind of... Um, okay. Uh, and it started as a, the idea, the basic idea, that um, when you make a creation, when, when you do a creation, painting or an architecture, whatever, you do not try to mimic reality. Okay. Which is in contrary to natural naturalism and you know realism. And realism okay but you're trying to convey an inner thing which is emotional like an emotion that is inside that you are trying to convey outside with external means okay and is it exaggerated and accentuated it's exaggerated exaggerated yeah in terms of like something which we know and we see it's not hiding that it's not real it's showing us that it's, it's something that, which is expressive. It's either expressive of an idea or a feeling okay. of the creator or even what he is talking about, what the content is talking about. First of all, the music, super exaggerated, very loud, that kind of supposedly takes you out of uh, your suspension of disbelief because they're playing so... But it works. I feel that it works really well and that it's just like, it's like its own genre, it's its own fantasy genre. Yes, there's kind of a spectrum in, in, um, in cinema or in, in art in general. Okay. So one side you have realism okay. and the other side you have expressionism. Okay. And it depends on how you want to convey this reality. Is, is the reality, is how important it is for you as a creator to convey reality that we know and feel and mm -hmm. live. For yeah. example, right? So in the or or the emotion, the raw emotion at the other end of the spectrum. The raw emotion, yeah, and the raw expressiveness of the idea of the creation, okay. right? So the so, Witcher. So the Witcher is kind of, I think, taking this spectrum like going towards expressionism. Like if you if you try to see it uh, in terms of you know uh, Game of Thrones, of course it's all fantasy. Yeah. But they're trying to create a world which you which you believe and has an inner reality and you kind of take yourself inside that reality yeah. because it's so believable, it yeah. has these rules and laws and yeah. everything is right, yeah. right? And then you, you understand say, everything. And then how come the dragon burned the wall but couldn't burn the little <laughs> wall with yeah, John yeah, exactly. and, and behind exactly. it? Like, no, plot hole and why? How come <laughs> the nurse didn't see the fleet? So this is what happens when you... Because when it's a very, very realistic exactly, story. Exactly. So you expect. You, you, yeah, exactly. You're building a world that has this kind of inner reality into it. Yeah. And then if you break it, then everybody starts yeah. shouting at you. <laughs> <laughs> but here in The Witcher, I don't know. I only know just by reading what he's drinking the entire season. Is, uh, the, the elixir. Ah, the one that makes his eyes go like this and then he has superpowers. Yeah, whatever. but they don't explain <laughs> it. <laughs> drinking? Okay, now I'm better. Yeah. Stronger? <laughs> okay, whatever. You don't know where, where shit is. Sintra, Nilfgaard, where are they coming from? You see like a map, but at the end of the season, they're coming from the south, but nobody, you don't understand why they're doing it, where are they coming from? You don't remember who is everybody, and you don't know where you are on the timeline. And it still works. Yeah. You don't have to it's know. It's expressive. It's expressive. <laughs> so this is why it's yes. okay. Like there are no plot holes. Exactly. And what again, what you're talking about, for example, is very content oriented. Like you're talking about what they're saying, what they're talking about. Okay. And I look a lot at how they're saying, which is the style. Like mm -hmm. how are we saying what, you know, when you create something, it's either what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. It always go has this duality. So in uh, The Witcher, there's a lot of uh, stylistic influences that again are not motivated by reality and not trying to mimic the way we see and the way we kind of convey, you know, understand reality with okay. our eyes. For example? For example, the lenses that they use and the effect that they use on the lenses. So it has a very disorienting um, distortion, a geometric distortion. If you look on the sides of the frame, you'll see that okay. it has this circular distortion, which is an optical um, kind of uh, distortion. Interesting. And what do you think the goal is for them to use that lens and to, to, to show the, the distortions? It's saying that we're talking about... Yeah, this is not real. Exactly. Look, this is a story yeah. and this Legend. is an expressive story and we're using this kind of expressive <laughs> elements to kind of hide, heighten you and heighten the reality and make you look at what we're trying to convey and not the reality of, ah, 
she's in a forest now, right? She, yeah, 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 this is not a real forest. This is something that we're talking about. And this is also uh, even heightened with the use of something of blurring elements in the frame. We're trying to, again, make your eye go to where we want. And we don't care that this is not how we see the world and how we experience the world. This is not something that we care about. So you're, you're in the forest. And then you have these kind of lights coming from what appears to be the trees, like, okay. like these very, very strong uh, lights, which are not motivated in any way. Nobody explains them in any way. Okay. And, and this is like very expressionist, like taking these elements and says, okay, we want to convey that this, this forest is, you know, beautiful, natural, but again, scary. Uh, African women are surrounded by uh, a wintry forest. So first of all, the lighting is very expressive and it's very in, in touch with the German expressionism. It's not like the sun setting or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah don't ask about it. And you it's don't like, ask about it. It's beautiful. Okay, exactly. It's beautiful and it's kind of scary. It, it, it conveys the idea of what the forest is yeah. and not the reality of yeah. the forest. Yeah. Who, who did this magic? What is this magical yeah. power? Or maybe there's like this big light with a guy standing next to it and it's shining, right? Maybe. No, who cares? Nobody. Does. Yeah, don't care. <laughs> this is just like, yeah. So and, but, it, but it does show, it does convey you what this forest is, how it is special, right? It's like, it's uh, alluring, but it's also scary. It's, it's all these kind of things. And they do it like with very kind of freedom, with a freedom, like yeah. saying, this is very, very uh, German expressionism, saying we don't care about reality. We're, we're trying to convey an idea. We're trying to convey a feeling or a, a mood or, or whatever through these kind of physical elements in, that you see. Okay, so uh, do you have, uh, can you give us some examples of uh, German expressionism and how it affected the cinema at large? And it's a very interesting period in terms of film in Germany. Germany is like, you know, in a bad state. Yeah. Uh, after the First World War. In the other hand, people, when they are in bad states, they go a lot to the movies. We see this a lot, a lot also in America with the Big Depression. Great Depression. Yeah, the Great Depression. And, and, and also so people have like uh, an urge to create. Urge to create. Actually, they have even an urge to spend their money on movies because their m money has no value. It always decreases in value because of the... Uh, so actually, it's weird, but... Whereas a band with bad uh, economical times, usually the movies thrive. Yeah, you have Nazis that thrive in movies. <laughs> exactly. Okay, okay, so it evens out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in the, between the two world wars, there was a lot, a lot of German films made. And they were uh, influenced uh, by uh, the Expressionism movement in painting and architecture, which was centered in Germany. And another thing that happened is the German state took all the studios and kind of made them one entity under their national... Um, okay. The Weimar so, Republic? Yeah, yeah. They made it the UFA, it's called UFA, I okay. believe. So uh, they, it was one entity that was very, you know, had a lot of power. Okay. They had to make movies that are, you know, according to the state, but they had a lot of power. This is, of course, another thing with something when you go fascism, also the cinema thrives because usually mm -hmm. the state uses the cinema to, for its own end. So the most influential movie of that time was The Cabinet of Dr. Calibari. And it was a movie that actually, you know, it was very interesting. It, it had uh, not only stylistic things that it contributed, but also content-wise. Like, it was the first movie that had, like, this um, twist ending, for example. Okay. And also the first movie that we saw, uh, The Unchrosy Narrator. So when you, like, you have someone telling you the story and then suddenly you understand that he's not very... you shouldn't trust him. Yeah. So you wouldn't have like the Joker, for example, without this movie. You actually see elements where you can connect elements from this movie straight to... If you see a Tim Burton film, think of Tim Burton in the silent era. Something like that, okay? Like it's, like, it's way out there. Like expressive in a way that it's over the top. Those are your hands? What happened is it influenced a lot of other German films to create in this kind of style. Okay. And because the German film industry was so uh, potent, a lot of um, directors came, for example, from Britain okay. to work in Germany. Example for that is Hitchcock, who worked in there like, and was in, as an art director and also as a uh, director assistant. And he got a lot of influence and influences from, uh, from that German expressionism, which he took back to England and then all the way to the States. 
and we know how many boom, yeah, from Hitchcock. But it's not just Hitchcock. A lot of the directors and cinematographers who fled from the Second World War to America took with them this kind of style and expression, and they actually made film noir movies, which what we see. So if you see film noir, it's just this dramatic lighting, mm. which is very German expressionist. Wow. Like they don't have to, yeah, you don't have to say why is this lighting coming here <laughs> or is this shaft of light here no put it there we're trying to convey a mood this is german this is very german this and also horror films like all the horror films that we see the expressive lighting like darkness and also the content the german expressionism was talking about um, broke bring that soul back to put the wrong things right interesting so 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 the germans that fled uh, the second world war and after the second world war built uh, nuclear bombs and made really good movies. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. so again, it's even that. It's even that. <laughs> and and gr nuclear great bombs, movies. Great movies. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Some sort of legend. <laughs> like, it, like it reminded me as if I was living, you know, a thousand or two thousand years ago and you're sitting around a campfire and then there's a storyteller telling the story of the Bible or Bible-like uh, stories and you listen and you, we haven't yet reached the age of uh, reason and enlightenment and you're not going, hey, but how come he now says this before he said that? This is, no, this is not important. It's not important. This is a different yes. way of, uh, of telling a story. It's very expressive and it's very big. It's very tragic. This is a story. You're along for the ride, and you don't have to pay attention to why, how the guy that fell off the cliff, how he became a dragon. I think it doesn't that matter. It, yeah. Does yeah. It? I think that what they did with the disorientation of the timelines is very nice, and it's very specific to the show. So yeah. they, they took like the the books and they decided to break this into three timelines happening in different times and also very disorienting I think yeah. that maybe that's what kind of you know it's hard for the in the beginning of the it's hard at uh, the beginning yeah also I, I didn't like remember it. like is this character this character yeah like I like I, I I had trouble following but when you understand there's like a huge payoff you're like oh okay now you got my attention yeah, now I, I wonder if they will tr can manage to keep it up in the second one, if it will be the same kind of uh, idea and the same kind of structure narratively. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but it was very, I think if it was like linear, it would be really... Yeah, way less interesting. Yeah. Way, way, way less yeah. interesting. So also about, uh, about how it's like a legend, I, uh, I mentioned the, the dragon uh, uh, earlier. I, I found it really refreshing how they told this story, which was a kind of like a standalone story, could be unrelated the to hunting the, of the, the dragon. Hunting, uh, yeah. hunting of the dragon, which is like the legend, the folk legend of the English hero yeah. uh, slaying the dragon and becoming a hero. That's why I brought you along, Geralt of Rivia. Nothing scares you. <sighs> then you don't know Yennefer of Angerberg. <laughs> May she be the worst encounter then. Here, the, uh, this knight, this English knight for king and country, he's a caricature, is horrible. For kingdom and glory! Psych. He's stupid and he dies shitting himself, Yeah, basically. So it's, this is like the opposite. And the hero, he does not slay the dragon, he saves the dragon. So it's like an interesting twist on this... Uh, you yes. know, generic, uh, generic tale about how you slay a dragon to save the town, which is how it was set up at the beginning. So that was an interesting twist uh, at the end. So it's like, I feel like as if The Witcher is like expanded the, the fantasy genre and just like, oh, OK, I didn't know that this was possible to do uh, to do to create a story that is totally different from all the other stories that doesn't even make sense to compare it to Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. No, this is a different story, different story mm -hmm. and uh, with its own merits. And by the end, I was super hyped up for season two. Mm -hmm. And OK, and, and also started reading the books. OK, I mean, uh, that was a very, very, very interesting. I felt like I learned a lot and I love The Witcher. I feel like you were a little bit too oh. much on the, on the yeah, side this entire, this entire video. Yeah.
Also, there are like you are actually taller than me, but there is a distortion effect where you see. You I'm see much shorter taller than him. I'm much much taller than yeah. him. But it, it, we're like being expressive. No, yes. actually, you should. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should go forward. Like that. Okay, so thank you everybody for tuning in. If you want, we want we, uh, we're gonna post some more uh, Witcher uh, content about the archetypes and maybe some other stuff uh, with the Noga. So make sure you subscribe and thank you, patrons, for supporting the channel. Boom, boom, boom. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for watching that video. I hope you enjoyed it. You know what I hear most often from new patrons coming into our Patreon page is that they've been enjoying God Academy videos for a long time and that they're happy that they finally can support the channel. So you too can be happy. Happiness is just around the corner. It's on patreon.com slash God Academy. Bliss. It's just one cup of coffee a month. Come on. I like coffee. You need coffee.